Good, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for that, um, that intro. Uh, despite all of this, does not walk on water, still eats cornflakes for breakfast. You know, ordinary human being. So uh, all of you can do all of this, uh, this, this stuff too. You've got to be around for long enough. I am now 65, so I've decided I can now be described as middle-aged. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about um, writing and reviewing grant proposals. Um, so there's my sort of big picture that... Uh, um, uh, while the whole, you know, getting a research grant is a bit of a lottery in the end, um, you've got to get into the lottery. And if you write a weak grant proposal, you won't get into the lottery. So what I hope that um, we can do today is to give you some ideas for what might your, make your proposal stronger. And I have to tell you, from reading lots of grant proposals, many grant proposals are pretty weak. Right? So that by applying a number of quite simple lessons, which we you know, may discuss today, I think you can make your proposals materially stronger, materially stronger, and thereby you know, get yourself into the, 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 the lottery stage of this um, entire process. Okay? Um, but this, is a, I mean, this whole question is something about which nobody has a monopoly on truth. You know, I've written a lot of proposals. I've read a lot of proposals. My aim today is to be quite highly opinionated and tell you what I think. But, I, I, but I'm very clear that what I think isn't necessarily what other reviewers think and definitely isn't necessarily just true. So a lot of people in the room, you know, notably Yvonne and um, uh, other experienced academics here will have been, um, particularly our um, colleagues over here from the research, research enhancement, is that right? Research funding development. Research funding development group over here will know, you know, will have quite different perspectives and lots of wisdom to offer. So it would be much more fun for me if this, um, this is why I'm standing here, not behind the glass screen, if we turn this into more of a conversation in which you can not just ask questions, but offer comments and uh, you know, insights of your own, OK? Um, so I'm sorry if I, I'm going to keep, I'm sort of keep, keep wandering around. You just have to um, put up with it. There's screens everywhere. So no matter which direction you look in, you'll still, still see a screen, OK? So, um, so that's good. Um, the first thing I think you should be very clear about when writing a research grant proposal is who you are writing for. Now, so you're writing for your panel. Uh, all, my, you know, all grant proposals in the end are going to be reviewed by some group of people. Um, and some of them will be experts. If you are lucky, there will be some people who really know your subject in reading it. But that's if you're lucky, right? And what you know for sure is that other members of the panel will be, not be experts. Um, so if you're lucky, they will give a superficial read to your proposal. Right? So you can be confident that many of the readers of your proposal, the ones you need to persuade, um, will not be experts. And they will not give you a lot of time. Right? So um, some of them, you know, the, the experts, the people who maybe who are assigned your project to read, they, they might give you, you know, half an hour of their lives. That's a big gift that they're making you of their personal lives. Right? Um, the, the other members who are maybe not assign, assigned your thing, but are just sort of watching the discussion go by and giving it a quick read might give you a minute or two. Um, so somehow, even though people are giving you this incredibly superficial look at your proposal, you want to convey to them something important about what you have to say. You cannot assume that your proposal is to be read by somebody like you. Okay, That's a sort of super important baseline position. So. I'm going to go through a number of things, a number of sort of, as it were, flaws that I have seen in proposals that I have read and invite you to reflect on them in the proposals that you've read and the ones that you're writing. Um, and then we'll, um, uh, later on, uh, uh, led by Yvonne, we're going to have a look at um, uh, one or two proposals that maybe you're writing and sort of in a, in a more interactive way. So here's number one. Proposals sometimes say something like, I want to work on better type systems for functional programming language. I call this a sort of vague proposal. You know, step one, this is what I want to do. Step two, give me the money, pretty much. Um, so this is all um, very well, but it doesn't, you, 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 I mean, this is common sense, right? You must identify the problem that you're going to tackle. Um, this is not really as easy as it sounds, right? Um, it's got it's to be, uh, you, you've got to say a bit about, what the problem is, and also something about why anybody might care about it. Um, so I was talking with 
is to break um, uh, earlier today about her proposals, which um, she, uh, none of you, incidentally, responded to um, Naval's question to, to provide uh, proposals that we could critique. So his poor spouse had to do it. Well done. Right. So this proposal was about um, um, uh, using biological materials to build epoxy resins out of which you could build the blades for wind turbines. Um, but, and, uh, and this was, it was framed as green epoxy resins, right? So it was clearly a sustainability thing to it. And, I'd, and, uh, and, and something about um, let's not use petroleum-based feedstocks. So I had misunderstood this as being, well, um, maybe if you use, a, but I, I was thinking petroleum, petroleum is bad if you burn it, that causes glo global warming. But actually it turned out that I mean, you don't burn it when you're making epoxy resins out of, out of it. You, you make them into turbine blades. But um, what your, your real idea was, you want to um, not then put those turbine blades in landfill. You'd like them to biodegrade eventually in building them out of biological materials. But that was a misunderstanding I had about the purpose of the proposal. And, but, but it was something about which my level of ignorance about what you were trying to do was quite helpful because many referees will be ignorant. Um, and so it's really helpful when you're framing the problem you're wanting to solve, if you can articulate that problem to people who are not in your area, but who are still brave enough to tell you what they don't understand. All right. Um, uh, let's see, did I have anything, anything to say about that? Yes. So um, what is the problem? Why is it an interesting problem? And why is it an important problem? Um, so why is it interesting speaks to, is it a research problem at all? Or is it, quote, just engineering? Which I think, by the way, does disservice to the engineering profession, because engineers do a lot of important things. But you do need to, it, it, there's a balance here. You need, to, you need to say, there is some research to do here. Right? It's, not, it's not already, there isn't already a known solution to the problem I'm articulating. And then you want to say something about, why is it an important problem? And this gets to another part of the conversation we had. I'd say, well, you know, if we only make two turbine blades a year, it doesn't really, you know, maybe we should invest our research effort and our research money in, in things that were, would uh, label us to recycle things that we use in much greater volumes. Um, well, it's clearly not just two a year, um, but we have, to, we have to say why this is, uh, the, the volumes here are enough that we should care about the sustainability. Always oh, just an example. Um, um, <clears throat> and here, a lot of you, I think when you're writing proposals, or I mean, just walk, talking around the room earlier, um, have spoken about the partners that you're working with. It's really helpful if you can have a partner, um, a sort of customer for your research. It adds a lot of credibility to a proposal to say someone is willing to say that if this problem is solved, I would be interested in the result. We might actually use it. That's really helpful. It, adds, it gives you a lot of credibility. Um, and it's much more credible if your partner is doing more than just writing you a warm letter and saying, we'd love them to solve this uh, problem and we'll think about it if they do. If they say, oh, we're going to participate in weekly meetings and, you know, they're going to use our test beds and our access to our customer base. That's a whole different kind of level of commitment that they're making. Um, so there are lots of different kinds of letters of support you can get, and some carry a lot more weight than others. Okay. Now you've all been very quiet and respectful. I think it's by, by now, I hope some, some, somebody might have something they might want to say. Um, I want to say, talk about novelty in a second. Any, any comments so far? Observations, questions? I should be terribly disappointed if you continue in this way. Yeah. What are you expected to provide in terms of framework of how this problem has been tried to solve by other people? Oh, good question. So this is kind of related work question. So, um, so um, I would say as a proposal reader, the thing I don't want to do is read on page one a long section of related work. Right? I think on the early start, my advice would be make some bold statements that says, here is a problem that is not yet solved. You know, uh, and you can briefly describe present solutions. There might be a bit more information later. But don't force me to wade through um, a, a, a half a page of prior work when I'm just trying to get the gist. I'm trying to get to your key idea. Um, it's a difficult balance because you also don't want to appear ignorant of what has gone before. You've got to say, I'm building on the shoulders of giants. Um, but the emphasis on, I'm building on them rather than I'm going to tell you about everything they've done. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, particularly in the early stages. Let me say something about novelty. Because often in grant proposals I've read, they say, this is a new idea, right? This is novel research. Now. In physics of nanomaterials, 
a novel piece of research has intrinsic merit, and some of you will be in those kinds of fields, right? But simply learning something new about the natural world that surrounds us is something new. It adds to the sum of human knowledge. In computer science, which is my home matey, and some of you are from um, ECS, novelty is a very little merit. Novelty on its own. Right. So computer science, it's like a, um, a sort of fractal subject, right? Because we make it in our minds, right? It's a synthetic subject. No matter where you dig in computer science, you can make more complexity, more depth. It's like exploring the Mandelbrot curve, right? Um, so if I show you a Mandelbrot curve and then, you know, I can dive into a part of it. That was an interesting part. Then I dive into a part. And soon I've zoomed into a level that is so tiny of the Mandelbrot curve that if you looked at it at the original scale, it would be barely visible. You would say, that's really interesting to me. But why? Right? No, so, so this varies between subjects. But so this is um, a quote from Fred Brooks' essay, um, The Computer Scientist as Toolsmith, which I love. He's almost a poet. But he says, um, if we recognize our artifacts as tools, right, so the things we build in computing, and probably a lot of ECS work, right, we test them by their usefulness and their costs, not by their novelty. I'm a programming languages person. If I invent a new programming language, is that useful? Um, well, I've got to, I have to ask, is that useful? Not, is it novel? It's not enough to be novel. Does that make sense? Um, but you would be amazed how many people make that a major plank of their research proposal. Okay. Good? Um, oh, so I, I think I've said this. Yes, yes. Oh, but I did want to say, uh, this is a computer science specific um, point, is that one of the lovely things about computer science being a fractal subject is that unlike, say, um, uh, I don't know, biology um, uh, or biochemistry, where the, the boundary of the subject is quite well defined and research groups are kind of in competition with each other for who will publish the next paper around that particular area, in computer science, um, the area that you're working in is probably underpopulated. Probably you're the only person there. Um, your problem is getting other people interested in it, not being the first to publish in that area very often. So I quite like that because it makes, the, it makes us culturally more collegial, more inclined to work with each other, more inclined to tell each other about what we're doing. So, um, other stuff. Yeah. But of course, it does. Um, uh, the downside is it's just easy to be self-indulgent. Well, I study it because it's interesting to me. Nobody else cares. You've got to explain why the reviewer should care. OK? All right. So um, this is another quote from Fred Brooks' essay. Um, the computer, you can, the computer scientist as toolsmith. You see, he's, 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 he's using um, building tools as his analogy to say that's what computer scientists do. They make things that are useful. That's what tools are. Um, I love this, uh, this quote. If we perceive our role of right, we see more clearly that the proper criterion for success, a toolmaker succeeds as and only as the users of his tools succeed with his aid. However shining the blade, however jeweled the hilt, however perfect the heft, a sword is tested only by cutting. Right? So take this to heart. That swordsmith is successful, whose clients die of old age. <laughs> okay. So um, that's about purpose, right? What problem am I trying to solve? Why is it an important problem? Why is it an interesting problem? And you will articulate that in a way that you can, that, that a non-expert can grasp in a short period of time. Okay. Second thing. Um, so now here's a proposal. This this also is extremely common, in which. Uh, the, um, the proposal writer is now being quite specific about what they want, the problem they want to solve. They want a problem to solve the you know, deadlocks and race conditions and concurrent programs. That's a tricky problem, right? And they're going, I'm going to solve it, right? So what they're really doing is they're describing a distant, very tall, very tall mountain and saying, uh, with sunlight at the top, right? And saying, that would be a good objective, um, right? I'd like to... Um, uh, find a drug that cures cancer. That would be a, a distant uh, mountain, right? But nobody's going to fund a proposal that does that, right? Because it's unrealistic. So you need to, you, it's sort of not acknowledging the fact that, um, uh, you know, there are lots of dead bodies littering the, the mountain slopes, right? It's easy to identify an impressive mountain. 
it is so easy. So it is not, a, you know, it doesn't qualify your proposal as being interesting or worthy of funding, the fact you identify a difficult challenge. That's not, that's not hard. Right? So, um, instead, you've got to convince the reader that you, ha you have a chance of scaling the mountain. Right? So how do you do that? Well, um, uh, you provide them with a little pathway up the mountain. So I, well, actually, I think there are two things. One is you say, here is my idea. You've got to walk up to, not just with an aspiration, but with an idea, something that says, I have got you know, the toolkit, the tool, the idea that will enable me to climb the mountain that I've described. That's it. Right? Um, so you're, then you describe a pathway up the mountain. Now, it, it can't be a guaranteed tarmac pathway you know, lit all the way to the top, because then it wouldn't be research. Right? So it can be precipitous. There can be steep patches and stony bits. But you have to somehow say um, uh, that there is a plausible route. Um, and uh, moreover, that among all the people in the world, you are one of the people who are best equipped to follow that plausible route. Right. So there's two parts to this, um, the pathway and, and yourself. So the pathway is, you know, what, 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 what's, what's your idea? You want to identify your promising idea. Um, and, uh, and for Easterbrook, it was, um, uh, you said, well, we can, build, we can take biological materials that, um, uh, that can be made to build resins, but all of the existing ways uh, have bad shortcomings, particularly as regard their electrical properties. Um, and then you said, uh, but my plan is to build, you use biological materials to build an epoxy resin starting, quote, at the molecular level. Um, so at this point, as we, we talked, I, I didn't read the proposal terribly carefully. It was just on the train. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of a bit magical. Um, and uh, so I didn't, I didn't find enough easy to get at evidence that it was, as I put here, evidence that it's a promising idea. Right? And that evidence can take many forms. It could take the form of some kind of track record publications or prototypes, or you're referring to your master's student's work that you'd found very promising. Right? Not published yet, but it's still evident. You can call to, call to mind, or, um, or even you know, the fact that your, part, you, your partners are genuinely interested because they actually think this is a good idea and that you have got a way that you can scale this. Um, do, do you see the difference? It's some, some way to say, I have an idea, and it's not just an idea that I made up in the bathtub last night. I have done some prior work that suggests that it's a promising idea that while it's not a paved, lit pathway to the top of the mountain, there is some reason to believe that I'll be able to get there. There's some rocky bits, and maybe you'll even identify them later in the proposal. But you can, it's not just, trust me on this, guys. I, you know, I've got this. Give me the money. That doesn't work. OK? It'll pause for comments and thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's just going to get a proposal. Um, any, any thoughts or observations so far? Will yeah. the slide be available later? Yes, the slides will be available later. Yeah, please. Psych psychology, is that right? Yes, good. Yeah, it's so probably very different in psychology. I can't, um, yes. No, we are not psychologists <laughs> in that sense. Uh, all the time interpreting people's behavior. So evidence. Um, I'm actually struggling with this mm -hmm. because one can uh, invest time in preparing a proposal, or one can work on preparing publication. I was wondering, what is your take on what is the strong evidence? The track record of publications in that field, preliminary work, a good partners, for example, that you mentioned. I guess an organic. You mean sort of what, what sort of, of evidence is most convincing? Exactly. Mm. And if you have the choice of, well, not having the choice, but where you have to put your force on to preparing the evidence in terms of published work or really finding strong uh, mm. partners, I guess it's a combination of all of them. But I guess it is. But I mean, as far as published work is concerned, you have enough pressure on m having publications anyway, like academics do. So I don't think it would make sense for you to say, ah, oh, to make my proposal strong, I better have more publications. Oh, well, that's easy to do. Let me just write a few more papers. You'd be doing that anyway, right? So I mean, if that would not affect your behavior, anyway, you just got to go with what you have. And of course, the stronger your research record to date, that puts you in a better position. It can, I have read proposals which have a sense of entitlement about them that say, we are 
at a Russell Group University. We have publications um, to the end of the, you know, we're a fantastic research group. You know, we are, you, you, you can't go wrong if you give us the money, so give us the money, right? But I want to say, write me a good proposal, right? Everyone else has to. So, so in other words, it, um, uh, I don't, I think the good referees probably do not judge primarily on track record. Um, in fact, is there, is there an element of double blindness to reviewing these days? Um, Some funders have tried it, but it's not. It's pretty hard to do, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Welcome Trust have definitely did a few pilots on that, but yeah, um, it's very hard to do because there's so much. How how do you blind it effectively? Yes. If you're going to have someone's publication. Exactly. Effect. Yes, that's right. How could you do that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a bit tricky. So um, and then. But uh, when it comes to partners, I wouldn't see partners that, that are just for the sake of it, you know, to make your proposal look good, right? Because that, uh, good referees, if the process is working well, they'll see through that. Uh, it might not work well, you might be able to fool them, but I wouldn't well. What's, what's really good is partners who actually want the research that you're doing. That's good, right? Because that helps to focus you on a problem that someone What's the answer to? That's pretty exciting. It's quite motivating, really. So I suppose I would I'd encourage you to um, focus on things that are real rather than things that are trying to look good for a proposal. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's easy, to, easy for me to say, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, Funders hate any risk. Oh, hating. This is about risk. Risk. Research so, risk. Yeah. Yes. So the idea of wanting here, it seems like there's a greater appetite for risk. Mm -hmm. They want you to be making a bigger jump with your project. And in the US, they want it to be stepwise and want to show that it's, they basically want to do the project before you do it. So, how do you give any advice on how to walk the line to make sure that it's clear that you're advancing the field without making it sound too risky? Uh, and you get terribly contradictory messages about risk from funding agencies because all funding agencies will say, we want to fund groundbreaking innovative research, right? And we must, you know, make, do moonshots. But then you send them a moonshot proposal. I said, you haven't got a prayer of doing this. Right? We definitely won't fund that. So they emit contradictory messages. And so I don't think there's a sort of silver bullet answer to your question. I think for, for me, it's um, uh, you just have to explicitly walk the line that says, I have promising evidence, right, that the pathway I'm suggesting is, you know, stands a good chance of success. But there are rocky bits. It is not a solved problem. There will be research risk here. Um, and maybe, and here's how I'm going to mitigate it. You know, even if this doesn't work, then I'll still have this. Um, I, I suppose being as upfront as possible about where the risks are um, and what your mitigation strategies are is quite good. Um, I, I don't know how to resolve the big question about, but I, I've read there's, there's, there's a very nice short paper in CACM by, I'm blanking on the, the guy's name, called In Praise of Incremental Research. It's lovely because it says actually, for all the funding agencies talk about they want moonshot projects, most research is another brick in the wall, and walls get built out of bricks. And they are big walls and important walls. So that, um, and the advantage of research, that w which is uh, where you, you, you know, you actually make progress, even if you haven't completely blown everybody out of the water, is that well, it's that's that's progress, right? <laughs> Build another book on top of that. Um, um, so, not a very well characterised answer to your question, but um, uh, uh, you could say identifying risk sounds like a negative. But you can also say, here are the research questions I'm addressing to which we do not currently know the answer. Right? That could be a, another way. That's identifying the rocky bits. Right? But, but even if I can't completely solve this, we'll still have this good outcome. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Uh, on that line, um, I, I was also wondering about um, if, if your proposal is about something that is completely new, uh, which might not have too much evidence. Uh, and, but also there is a significant amount of risk. Oh, you mean if it's about something completely new where you don't have preliminary work to point to? Yeah. So quite often good research is a question of um, p uh, sort of combining two different fields. You're yeah. saying let's apply AI and machine learning to this existing research problem. Yeah. So you could, so I suppose then um, being explicit that you are combining two fairly well understood disciplines and, and you, and, but then why do you believe, you believe in your heart that this will be a productive combination, mm -hmm. right? 
you're planning to devote some of your personal life cycles, which you will never have again, to, to pursuing it. There must be a good reason you believe that. Right? It's not, probably not, it, it, there's, there is some evidence that you are using to drive your motivation and enthusiasm. Um, well, I mean, even if it's not formal evidence, you could still sure. say what it is. Why do you believe it? Because you've seen something like that work somewhere else, or because you've had a student project that worked well? There will be something. Um, and you can say, you, uh, uh, you can be explicit and say, you know, so, so, so far, the, you know, this, is, this isn't a completely new area. Nobody's really studied this before. I have some sort of, some evidence that it's likely to be productive, but that's why I'm proposing at the moment a fairly small project to establish whether it is, and you can expect me to come back later with another much bigger one or something. Um, I would say, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, let me say a little bit about um, part two. Remember, part one was uh, explaining your idea. Part two is explaining why you are the person to execute on it. Now, this is something that people find difficult um, because nobody, uh, with a few exhibitionistic exceptions, likes blowing their own trumpet and saying how wonderful they are. But this is a moment at which you should, right? It's it's it's. Amazing how often you read a proposal where it says, you know, it had been shown that, and then they put a, you know, citation in. And you read the citation as an assiduous referee, you of course look at the citation. You think, darn it, oh, blooming neck, uh, that's the proposer. Right? You think, if only they told me that. If only they'd said, two years ago, I showed that, you know, this thing happened, rather than putting it in the passive voice with a citation, you have to be a detective to follow up. Right? You're trying to establish yourself as a leader in the field which you probably are in this particular part of the field. So um, I think it's, uh, you want to not be very neutral, but express explicit value judgments about what has worked in the past and what has not, and express them in, you know, in, in you know, dispassionate language, but nevertheless express value judgment uh, um, um, opinions. Uh, and ones that, uh, you know, as bold as you can, you can say, like, uh, you said the existing approaches using um, uh, naturally occurring biological materials simply don't work very well for this application. Right. That was a kind of bold statement. Somebody, it would be possible for an expert to say, she's completely wrong, they work perfectly well. But, but you, it was a statement that as, an un an, as a reviewer, I could understand and say, the experts will tell me if this is completely bogus, but for now, I'm just going to trust you for now. But if you just said, you know, various work has been done on biological materials, blah, 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 sort of, it was all fluffy, I wouldn't have known what you thought. Um, so make bold statements if you possibly can. Um, use the first person if you possibly can. We did this, I did that, um, even, you know, how soon it is. So, um, and I would also suggest uh, that people might differ on this, that you do not rely on the track record section. Many proposals let you have a page to describe your track record. I would assume that nobody would read it. That would be my base assumption. Um, they may, if you're lucky, but if you assume that nobody reads it so that you have in your main narrative something that positions you, uh, you and your colleagues, as the group that are really well positioned through this particular piece of work, I think you're in better shape. Rather than assuming that the referee will cleverly simultaneously be reading the track record section and will cross-reference it and realize that your idea, oh, look, the stuff they wrote over here means that they're ideally positioned through the stuff they're writing over here. You want to make that narrative completely explicit rather than require your referees to by detective work, uh, make those connections. Okay. Um, so th this is difficult, and you may need to get your friends to help you um, in uh, being making strong enough statements about. So, so um, when I said strong, defensible statements, saying that we were the first to do something is always a great thing to be able to say, especially if it's true. Um, you know, or even just that your paper two years ago was influential. You don't like saying that. But find a colleague in your area and say, what, you know, what, what could I say that would actually be true? What your, your goal is that for an unbiased referee who knows your area to say, yeah, it was pretty influential. Um, uh, and you know, being recognized as a world, world leader is often a good, good term. And the nice thing is that if you, um, uh, you know, if you find a small enough part of the fractal, you can always be a world leader. Right. <laughs> So just choose your terminology, right? <laughs> your little part of the Mandelbrot curve, you are. <laughs> your little part of medical AI applied to medical devices, that's it. <laughs> okay, enough said. So, so far, so good. Now, uh, next main chunk. So we talked about um, uh, here's a well-formulated, important, interesting problem. 
here is a promising idea with some evidence that it's promising and some evidence that we're a great team to work on it. And then the proposal gets, says, essentially, we'll work on it. Give us the money. Um, so that's a kind of trust me chap. So, so that we have got a bit of a, you know, um, the, the promising idea gave us a, a bit. But I think it's really um, helpful to, to do more than say, we'll work on it using our promising idea. And the question that I always ask about a proposal is, how would I know if this proposal had succeeded? How would I know if this proposal had succeeded? Now, so here are some bad phrases. We're going to gain insight into something. We're going to develop the theory of this. We're going to study that. We're going to produce a database of this. Right? Um, produce a database. That sounds like a, that's a bit more concrete. Um, actually, that, I think that was in your proposal again, right? Um, and so it's good. That, that sounds like something I could, I could say, did you produce a database? But on the other hand, it could be a database that nobody ever looks at, I suppose. Um, but you know, the trouble is that the first three of these are not really falsifiable. At the end, could I say, well, no, you didn't study it? Of course not. You're going to spend three years studying it or four years studying it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like these, these phrases are like overcooked spaghetti. They're floppy, right? What you want is to, to provide success criteria that are like celery. They're crunchy. You know when you've bitten into one. Um, and you know how to distinguish success from not success. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Um, I know we'll build a, an analyzer for my uh, C programs that can analyze big one, big C programs, 200,000 line C programs in you know, reasonable time, you know, less than a few minutes, to get insights that we just can't currently do. Right? So then either, they, either at the end of the project it will or will not. Or we'll build a um, you know, prototype walkabout information access system and try it out in a hospital with actual consultants and uh, you know, provide a report with their writ the written feedback of live consultants in a clinical situation. Then they say, did they get it into a hospital? Because the consultants are not going to waste their time, right? They're not going to bother if it doesn't, doesn't work at all. Um, so just that is, is interesting. And then what did they say about it? Do you see the difference between the celery and the floppy spaghetti? Um, and so I think this is... Um, uh, this again, returning to our question about um, uh, how you know how to de devote your your cycles. This isn't just to make proposal look good kind of thing. This is actually quite focusing. I've used it myself in thinking, how could I know if my project has succeeded? Well, I need to find someone who would care and who would say that they cared, or something that I can measure. Um, it helps to or organize and focus the work that you do. So I'd really commend it to you as a um, just ask yourself again and again, how would I know? How would somebody who wasn't a deep expert in my field, how would they know if my project had succeeded? Funnily enough, the research councils that I've um, worked with in the past don't really make much effort to look at proposals they have funded in the past and ask whether they've succeeded or not. I don't, is that changing at all? Do they? It was mostly just once, once you've got the funding, they sort of let go of it, don't they? Yeah, I would, yeah. Say, I would say that's definitely the end of the pipeline that is... That's the end of the pipeline they pay a lot of attention to. Yeah. So in fact, you'll get away with it. You will get away with proposals. But that's the other thing to say is, if you say, look, um, you know, I'm going to build an analyzer that will analyze that tooth, what you don't need to worry about is that four years later, somebody will say, but you didn't, right? Because <laughs> they're not very good about following up on these things. Because what will actually happen is, actually, that turned out to be too difficult. But you encounter with glory about researches that if you we're, we, we're positively encouraged that when we are marching along towards an objective and we come across um, a brick wall like Alex here, instead of, you know, like in industry, you just have to, you know, climb over Alex or call under him or hurl him to one side. There's any way to get to the objective. In research, we'd say, ooh, that's an interesting problem. Let's study that. You turn through 90 degrees and, and do something completely different. So instead of building your analyze, you did something else that had great publications, was a really good, like where my first big research grant was to build a parallel piece of hardware to execute functional programs. We did build it. It was amazing fun, completely useless in research terms. I mean, nobody ever used that technology to build parallel hardware, but it launched my research career in compilers for functional programming languages. So the, the main payload was completely different than the one I'd advertised. But I had advertised something that was tangible, and you could say, did I do it? See the difference? So, um, so don't worry about being stuck with objectives you ultimately don't meet. Um, uh, but very helpful to focus around meeting. Okay, so far so good. Any other observations? Yes, yes, please, Laura. Um, I was just wondering, um, 
I think that uh, one of the most difficult uh, things when um, we we uh, write a proposal is that there is not enough space. Not enough space. Yes. Yeah. All these yes. Yeah. Uh, to uh, uh, to propose a new idea, to uh, explain uh, or your objectives. Do you? Could you? No, not enough space. Us? Six pages. You've got to do this in one page. In one page. Yes. Yes. And the great thing about one page is you can write it ten times, right? Because it's only short. It's not like having to rewrite your PhD thesis. Um, you can iterate a lot. So and. Uh, it's harder work writing one page than writing 100 pages in some ways. Um, but I do think that if you, if you have a compelling story to tell, I mean, you're in your heart, you are passionate about the research that you want to do. Um, and you know, if you explain it to your, you know, to your partner or to somebody that you meet on the train, you would find a way to convey in five minutes something about your passion and about why you thought it was interesting and important. And um, you know, I know nothing about dielectric materials, and, but I learned in, in a 10 minutes conversation with you, I learned more than certainly I've multiplied my knowledge about biomaterials for wind turbines by a factor of 100. Um, it didn't take long. It didn't take long. Um, so it's painful because every line is soaked in your blood and perspiration. Um, but at the same time, I think it's quite a good discipline. I'm, to, to boil it down. So, but it's a struggle. Yes. Um, it's an iterative struggle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so about fulfilling the objectives, um, you mentioned that there is no going back and checking whether you met those objectives ah. or not. But let's uh, imagine that I want, I submitted a proposal to the EPSRC and yeah. it was successful. The next round that I want to submit to EPSRC, I should be a little bit vigilant whether I met those objectives or not. That was always my assumption. <laughs> I don't think they pay the slightest attention, do they? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't think they measure outcomes like that. No, well, I mean, I suppose <coughs> if you're building on something that you said you were going to, you know, if it's a continuation of the story, yeah. then they're going to, that essentially mm. it's going to go to different peer reviewers. Yeah. It's going to be assessed by a completely different panel um, by that, you know, three or four years down the line. So. Yeah. And there are other ways in which you might evaluate it. Like, um, you know, did, did you, have you published anything since then yeah. based on that research, yeah. right? Because that's a peer reviewed mechanism that says, well, it might not be what you said you'd do, but the, you know, the community has judged that some things that you've done have been valuable. No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Like, for example, at Marcy, I used to run our Marcy Grove. We do have the steering committee every half a year. And we actually do have to remove the yeah. grass. And I actually mm -hmm. felt for that particular grow, maybe that's at Mercy how they do it. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't have a lot of wiggle room to get something. MRC. MRC. Oh, yeah. maybe, maybe some research organizations, and, and maybe, I don't know, the World Bank, who was applying for funding from the World Bank, your, your, your statistics, you were, right, they may have different monitoring mechanisms. Um, so you may, may have more, more or less wiggle room, yes. But even then, you know, it is research. You come to a rocky, steep place, it turns out that that problem was harder than you anticipated. And, you could be, and then, so nobody is going to say, well, you know, just go on hurling yourself at the rocks, because you will say, no, look, I, I, I think we should plan this alternative, and they will say, of course you should do that, yeah. right? You know, human beings are, in the end, are, are reasonable. If you, can, if you can explain to them why you're not just, you know, lazing around and not getting on. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I think I'm nearly, uh, nearly finished, right? So, what, so what's the word? Um, a little bit about related work we talked about. Who was asking? Who was, who was speaking about related work? We were um, discussing. Um, that, so um, so I... I even in the body of the proposal, I would suggest not spending a lot of time on related work, but you do need to somehow demonstrate that you know what it is. Um, uh, and one way to um, demonstrate your knowledge of related work without, sort of, without it being totally boring is to use it as a sort of springboard. For it, because usually on the, you do a sort of page worth of intro that explains the whole story, as we'll um, look at in a second. Um, and then you sort of have got another uh, several pages of give you a bit more detail. And the bit more detail part, you can perhaps mention some of the related work because that leads you into a position, but as an intellectual journey, you take your reader on into a position to understand what your idea is. That could be quite a good way of getting the related work stuff in without it just saying, mm, related work. So, um, there's a, many proposals, certainly EPSRC ones, ask you to provide some kind of methodology and work plan. Um, and for me, I find as a reader, 
that's the least interesting part of the proposal, but I kind of trust you that we, if you're, you know, once you've got to the point of convincing me you're a good team, you've got a good idea, um, I want, you know, I want to fund you, then the particular details of what you want to do and whether you're going to spend 3.5 RA months on it, I'm, I'm less interested in. So they may ask for it, but my, I don't know whether you get any different advice. My suggestion would be compress that part in favor of the other stuff we've been talking about. Um, your sort of work plan, but it's often the other way around. In the proposals I read, I see a page and a half of general intro, the stuff we've been talking about so far, and four pages of you know how many research, how many months will be taken to do this in Gantt charts and so forth. Yes, Jackie. Yeah, I'd say that's as someone who's been employed to write lots of bids for other people. Yes. Not in the university, but outside as a consultant. So what I I would definitely say that think. One is really understanding your funder and the core that you're going to. So I find that's often people are very focused on their project and not enough on what that specific what they're looking for. Yes, they're looking for because you can massage. So I would work my clients and say, what's the thing that you want to get funded, and then how do we, you know, give it a makeover, yeah, and dress it up and make it look smart and spicy and really exciting for that call, yeah, because that's another thing that I think. Yeah, we haven't talked about calls. You're quite right to, to, to call me out on this. Often agencies will have calls to say, we want something about um, um, AI and medical ethics. They might have a special call for that or about nanomaterials yeah. or something, yes. And then you have to frame your proposal yes. to meet those objectives, yes. yeah. So there's definitely that about it. And I'd say the, the thing about, I mean, well, I've, you know, I've also taught students to write essays. So that, that thing about the pathway the narrative pathway. So I would teach my non-native writers <laughs> that, that I would tell them that, that writing an essay is like going through a forest yeah. and you need to hold your reader by the hand and keep them on the path so they don't get lost. In, yeah. They don't get lost in the dark trees. And not expect them to play detective. No, no. And you, <laughs> you're holding their hand all the way through from mm -hmm. the introduction to the conclusion of this, you know, writing an essay, but it's much the same principles for this narrative that you need to have held your reader by the hand all the way through this story. And, yeah. and if they've got bored, they will wander off yeah. to start picking blackberries. Yeah. So don't bore them um, and put the best bits up front. You know, grab them. Yes. And don't underestimate the extent to which stuff that you know they don't know. Yeah. There's another part of our conversation this morning. Uh, we were talking about existing biomaterials um, uh, not, not working very well, so we're going to do things on the molecular level. Doing things on the molecular level, say, so I've got some experience of doing that with inorganic materials, but it's actually much easier uh, with organic materials. It, not only is it easier, but it's less studied and seems very promising. Because, so that now I'm excited, right? Because now you tell me that all the experience you've got, you're going to apply in an area where actually it's under-researched and looks as if it would be you know, easier. It's like, it's kind of like oh. Um, but, but that wasn't explicit in what you'd written, uh, at least not. Um, but, but in talking to you, I, I learned that. I felt much more excited then. Uh, so that's what you mean by leading them by the hand, right? You've got, you've got to you've got not, not make assumptions about what they already know. And it's very difficult to know when you're making assumptions, because you know it so well. It's part of your implicit mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah, Vaughn. I think, and also not to get lazy around that point, because some people are often tempted to say, well, I'll just add a hyperlink and they can go and find out their information. It's like, no, it's everything that needs to be in that six pages, you know, otherwise you're no. relying on them to find out. Zero hyperlink following. Yeah, they're not going to do, do it. Yeah. yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just going to add a caveat that. I think this is where the expert reviewers first. Mm -hmm. so this is oh, on the work plan? Say, yes. Mm -hmm. This is where they say, I don't believe the how. Maybe, or it's not clear to me that this how is de-risked. Because they, they can see through those steps that maybe the more generalist reviewer can't. So they buy the big picture. Yeah. And, uh, but then if that's your criteria, and if you think, OK, so my, my goal for this little part is to convince an expert reviewer that the how will work, right? That's very different from just saying, I've got to crank out something that says how many person months is being spent on X and Y, right? You say, okay, so the major research risk here is will we be able to prove this theorem or will we, you know, will the, uh, you know, the detailed model of endomorphic defibrillators work at all? Um, then, so uh, that's a good point. But I've, um, I think 
my own experience in well, I've been trying, maybe your experience have you been have you read proposals too in this, as an evaluator so then, then you as an expert you look you, you you're looking in detail there good that's a piece of evidence actual reviewer looking at that evidence but maybe maybe it doesn't need to be too big in volume it just needs to be enough to convince you yeah so if you as a reviewer if you read a really good piece of Proposal of the idea, the idea is right, but then there is a flaw in your methodology. Would you approve it and say you probably need to fix that, or would you say sorry? Or would you rather do which one is more likely? I very, I, I think it's very implausible to have a you know a sort of fundamental flaw that says you know um, it'll, it'll never work because of because of X. I mean, I suppose that it could be a problem, but it might be a might be a suggestion. You might consider doing this instead. Seldom, can you? I can't imagine having a. You know, a fatal flaw in the in the method that you know will be unfixable. It's the kind yeah. of thing they'd raise in, in their review that you'd then have to respond to. And they'd say, I don't yeah. believe that this is possible, and you'd have to respond to it and say, Yes, but because of this paper, then yeah. it's been proven to be possible. And, or even better, show where you showed that in the proposal. I, I don't. It <clears throat> depends on the funder. But I don't think they. It wouldn't cause it to reject that right if you if it was unless it was that. I think when, you, when you're sitting around a table in a panel meeting, and it only takes one person to say, just don't find this very convincing, this proposal. Just that one phrase, you know, can, you, you know, you, you, you sort of sink down. It's very, so, but the, I, think the, I think it was rare for some detail of the method, you know, of the, the work plan to give rise to that kind of question. It would more be a lack of motivation or a, 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 the sort of the higher level stuff, I think, would be more likely to give rise to that. I'm conscious that we're going to, we're going to finish in, in nine minutes because we want to move on to um, a proposal. I've just got a couple of other things to say before we finish. So here is my you know, ideal proposal, right? Um, important problem, promising idea, world-class team. Here's what we should need, and here's how we will know if we've succeeded, and a sketch plan of how we're going to get there. That's this methodology bit, but which doesn't take up too much space. Now, please give us the money. Right, so now I'm, I'm getting more convinced. And so this is when we're looking during um, Yvonne's session shortly, we're going to look at these, uh, think of these, um, we, might, we might leave these sort of up on the screen somewhere as criteria you can look through proposals. Does it, do, does it hit each of these bases? And I would suggest that you do all of this if you can. In, it, it usually don't ask for an executive summary. I would write one anyway as the beginning of your free text case for support. Write something that fits on one page that covers all of these points, right? It can forward reference to other bits to give more detail. Um, but some of your readers will read no more. You want to make sure that you're the reader who will only read one side of A4 gets the payload, right? If you spend uh, a page on general intro about the problem area, right, that reader is that comes away none the wiser. Okay. So now, um, some of you will have heard of the Heilmeier Catechism. He was a, um, a DARPA director, and he uh, produced this, this list of things, criteria that DARPA used or use to evaluate criteria. And this is very much the same. So I'll put this up. I'll give you the slides later. It's worth, worth a look. Um, you, and you'll find other material on the web around this phrase of the Heilmeier Catechism. Very much the same story. Um, but I, I want to leave you with two things. Number one. The very important thing to convey in your proposal is your passion for your field, right? Don't let that be sort of somehow covered over with endless accretions of rewrites, you know, forced by the <laughs> search announcement office. I'm sure you try very hard not to do this, but after it's been so endlessly polished, it can lose all the life. You want to convey that sense of you, you've got a glint in your eye and that you're going to destroy all obstacles to reach this objective. <laughs> that it's, it's, uh, that's what I, I think. Um, funders want to fund. Um, now, uh, the other thing, the second thing that I just want to um, mention to you is I think you can help each other, right? That you can help each other by asking other people in your department, your colleagues, to read your proposal critically and use them as guinea pigs one at a time, right? Guinea pigs, you can only give them the drug once, right? And then they, they will, once they've read your proposal, if you refine it, give it back to them. They'll say, I've seen this before, and they'll, you know, they have too much prior knowledge. So use them one at a time. Um, so, and your, your story is this. Please give me 30 minutes of reading time and then 45 minutes of conversation about it. Right? So you had actually about 15 minutes of reading time and about 20 minutes of conversation, but it was, um, and the, you, don't want them to, you don't want them to spend more time reading your proposal because your whole point is to see what a fairly superficial read will give. 
And the other thing you need to ed educate them on, I mean, this is what, what you, um, uh, yes, educate your readers, right, is don't tell me about spelling and punctuation. Ignore that completely. Instead, please tell me where you got lost, where you didn't understand the narrative flow, where you didn't feel convinced, where you didn't feel that this list of questions was absolutely answered on page one, right? And it takes a brave colleague to do that. You really have to try hard to tell them that is what you want from them because they will be tempted to be polite. We say, oh, this is a great proposal. I really liked it, right? Does that help you? Not a bit, right? Maybe it improves your self-confidence a bit. But what you want them to say is, I kind of liked it, but you know, about here, I was beginning to lose momentum. Um, I couldn't quite see how you would judge whether your proposal had been successful or not, your research had been successful. Do you see the difference? So you need to educate your friends in what to look for. And that's quite, quite difficult. Um, uh, and give them a checklist for what to do. Um, but the thing I like about this is it is cheap, it's informative, and it's effective. Right? It's cheap because you only ask them for 30 minutes of their time, plus a conversation with you, which they'd love to have anyway because they're your friends. Right? Um, it's informative because when, if you have participated as the reader of other people's proposals in a dialogue like this, you will write better proposals yourself. It's so informative reading other people's proposals because you think, Oh, I'm just not convinced by this, you know. And they're my friend, but I'll help them, help them improve it. But then you look at your own proposal through new eyes, right? Um, and I do think it's effective. So, um, actually, have I said this? Yes. Oh, the other thing is about attitude. Then when your friend says to you, I got a bit lost here, your temptation will be to say, you complete idiot. It's all there on page three, <laughs> right? You will say that in nicer language, but that's what you will think, right? But you have to train yourself to think, ah, Jane, who was trying hard, didn't get that on the first go. How could I rephrase it so that even Jane, my lovely friend, would not make that mistake another time? Right? Um, and remember that getting the criti criticism of this kind, constructive criticism from your friends, is so much better than getting it from referees around the, around the table, right? It's the kiss of death to get it actually at the meeting. It's not so good if it's a written feedback that you can then respond to. It's much better to get it from your friends and fix it right there. And it's much easier to do face to face than it is by email. Our conversation was much more rewarding than if I typed comments and you'd replied. You know, and it was much quicker too. Use much less of your time and much less of mine. So do it face to face or by phone, Skype. Yeah. Just a quick question in terms of uh, expectations. How many times do you think a first time or an early person writing proposals would? How many uh, iterations of writing that one page are necessary oh. for that to look? I don't know. I suppose. I don't use the same person twice if you can, right? No, I, uh, I mean, because for your proposal, right? I suppose you have to you have to judge when um, uh, one bad thing that can happen is you give it to one person they say I think you should say X, so you say X. Give it to the next person they say I think you should say Y, so you say Y. Then you give it to another person they say I think you should say X. <laughs> so you get you you can't satisfy everybody. So it can I be. I was more wondering yeah. in terms of when you write it for yourself, you mm -hmm. write the first draft. Yes. Say, this is bad. Okay, I'm gonna go and do it yeah. again. Do it again. How many oh, I it? wouldn't write it too often before you give it to somebody. Okay. Yeah, because uh, it is, for me at any rate, maybe this is a personality thing, yeah. that it's in dialogue with other people that I find that I, now I know what I think. I can't tell you how often I've been in conversation with people about their research proposal. I say, oh, look, but I got a bit lost here. What did you mean? And they say, oh, blah, 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 blah. And I say, oh, that was limpidly clear. Why didn't you just write that down? And they say, oh, <laughs> could I do that? So it's, it's somehow in a dialogue with somebody else, you say things come out of your mouth that do not come out of your pen. I don't know why that is. Why well, it's so important to do this in person. You would probably, you, 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 yeah. this has been your experience too. Yeah. So maybe even take a tape recorder to your meeting with your friend so you can hear, what did you say? <laughs> so yeah, don't, don't iterate too much by yourself. It's, yeah, okay. So in cyber review yeah. processes, so written, aren't they? So are, are we doing it wrong? Yes. Yeah. Maybe, well, I told you I'd be opinionated. I think you should do the inter internal review process should be a, it should be quite lightweight. Um, like there may be a brutal university thing that say you because you, but, but, but within a department, I think it's going to be very informal, with multiple iterations, definitely in person, and with no element of, you know, judgment about it. It's just, we're, we're just helping each other. And you're going to read my proposal next week. Um, I'm not a senior person sitting over you. I'm just your friend. Um, yeah, so uh, yes, uh, anything that is formal sucks the life out of this, I, th I think. Sorry, because oh, you yeah, probably, you have to run formal processes too, don't yeah, you? Yeah.
but you want yes. within a department well, this very collegial very mutually supportive thing mm -hmm. but also to say that research funds will we do offer bid reviews as well which gives you a, can give you that different perspective because yeah. we're not there to judge your science yeah but we are there as skilled writers of and understanders of your funder for example and can give you that a different way in to and you know the research agencies well, you know, you know what they, so, so you're a fantastic resource yeah. for everybody. Yeah. Um, but you wonder, the, iterating the story, the, you know, the intellectual journey that you're taking on, that's something to do with your colleagues, yeah. uh, probably before Jackie ever oh, gets yeah. involved. So that's yeah. That first, yeah. And then is that final, what I'd call the marketing, the polish, the skin, mm -hmm. um, getting those in the Yeah. <laughs> How do you get to know your funder? Oh yes, yeah, so I was. I th this was uh, kind of again. Jack would be um, uh, um, no better about this. Uh, I'm a bit out of date. Some funders will have program managers who you can actually speak to on the phone, yeah. and they are often friendly and supportive. They are actually human beings, <laughs> right? Uh, they honestly are. You know, whereas you people sometimes talk about research agencies as if they were run by some kind of robot evil <laughs> empire mechanism. You know. <laughs> But they're actually human beings who are desperately trying to do the right thing and who long to fund the best research and who are you know, happy to help um, guide you. So if you can find a way to get in conversation with them, brilliant. Uh, somebody, at any, any, who's, who's applying to NERC? You said you didn't know whether, yes, right. You said you didn't even know whether they had any such person. Maybe Jackie can help you find them. But they're, they do, don't they, Jackie? Um, they didn't be able to Having worked for a funder for a long time, sometimes think, why is no one talking to you? Exactly <laughs> right. They're <laughs> longing for you to phone them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very strange barrier, and we always wondered why it wasn't. Yeah. Break the invisible wall. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They are yeah. not faceless entities. They are living, breathing human beings who are trying hard to do the right thing. Yeah, um, things like taking the opportunity when the funders come to visit us. So yeah. We have funder visits, take that opportunity, come to those lunches and people judging my own slides, but come and have the coffee, go and speak to the big need for your funder make those connections and just email them you know they've got emails on their website if you can't find the connection talk to jackie and her team and and she'll link you up yes exactly um, don't treat it as a faceless bureaucracy it's the key thing um and the thing about knowing the funding the funding call is super important as well yeah uh, we should stop because it's it, we, we're on the hour uh, i just wanted to um finish but with on an encouraging note right um Actually, a lot of people don't follow these pretty simple lessons, but now all of you will, right? And your, your grant proposals will be much better as a result. Um, this is a, there's a, a link here, and I'll give the slides to Navar. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, so we're going to have more conversation. Yeah. <laughs>